The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. Thank you everyone for coming. My name is Jared Eckengren. Uh, I and Caitlin Thompson are the co-producers of the AWARE Project here in San Diego. Caitlin's a little sick today, so she's standing by. But, you know, um, we're really happy to have you all here. How many people are here at an AWARE Project event for the first time? Yeah. Holy smokes. <laughs> okay. Are we live? Have you got me? Okay, thanks. Um, Amazing. Okay, great. So, Aware Project, uh, for those of you who don't know, was started uh, a few years back uh, for really two purposes. One was to create conversation, balanced conversation, around psychedelics, uh, entheogens, medicines, whatever your name uh, for these compounds are. Uh, because if you've been in America or in anywhere in Western society in the last 50 years, we know there hasn't been a lot of fair, balanced information out there. So the goal here is to have events and bring together scientists, healers, drug policy experts, people who have been healed, common people, uh, to present the various aspects and perspectives on these compounds. Um, and then the second equally as important uh, reason is to build community, for people to have a space to come and talk about these things, to share with each other, to learn, um, and to have a safe space for us to be able to talk about these these um, really new and interesting, not new, ancient, but uh, really the interest has obviously swelled in recent times. So creating that space, and on that note, we need to keep this a safe space. And what that means is, even though we're talking about uh, compounds that have benefited many people, that some people use in their private lives. Um, this is not a space to solicit use of these compounds, it's not a space to sell, it's not a space to ask to buy. We really need to keep the sanctity of this space pure. Hello, hi, I'm Michelle, um, and I'm the president of the San Diego Mycological Society. So you're obviously here because you're interested in mushrooms. And there's obviously a lot more than just the psilocybin kind. Um, so on, there's two things. We have a group here in San Diego. We meet regularly <coughs> the first Monday of every month, except April is going to be on the second Monday. But what we pretty much do is it's a collaboration. We get a group. Uh, we usually get a researcher who's doing uh, research somewhere, actually international, and they'll come and give us all the the research that they're. Um, they're investigating. So sometimes, like Alan has come and spoken to our club several times um, over the years, and he'll be speaking about the mushrooms of Mexico. Um, that's the talk that he gave to us, and this one's going to be specifically in psilocybin. We had um, other people that do um, uh, like furniture and they different different things like that with mushrooms that come and talk to us. There are certain people that um, are out in the field doing, um, finding and collecting mushrooms in China and Tibet, and they also come to speak. So if that interests you, uh, we would love to have you join us. Very, very uh, important stuff. You know, there are a lot of people out there who think mushrooms can save the world, both environmentally and uh, from the perspective of our uh, internal uh, personal states. And so we are very, very lucky on that note to have a mushroom expert, a mycologist, Alan Rockefeller, uh, here with us, and I'm uh, going to tell you a little bit about Alan before I bring him up, and hopefully it's okay with you that I read your bio, I haven't uh, yeah, go ahead. memorized it yet. But um, Alan Rockefeller is a mycologist living in Oakland, California. He spends half the year hunting mushrooms in Mexico, where he documents a wide variety of fungal species. His experience in the field includes focuses on mushroom identification, DNA analysis, my micros microscopy, and photography. In the lab, Alan sequences the DNA of mushrooms from all over the world, getting new insights from existing species, discovering new species, and eliminating duplicates in the taxonomic record. So I am very pleased to introduce to you uh, Alan Rockefeller to be talking about
All right, thanks. It's really cool to see so many people here interested in mushrooms. And this talk is going to be kind of difficult. Um, be a lot of complicated things. So if you have any questions, you can just interrupt me and shout them out. And I'll also take questions after the talk. Uh, but probably best to ask them right when you think about them. So I just got back from a couple days of mushroom hunting in Mexico, and then before that, like five months of mushroom hunting in Mexico. So Mexico has more psilocybin mushroom species than any other place um, in the whole world. But we also have quite a few in California. So first, I'm going to focus on all the Southern California psilocybin mushrooms. And then we'll see some of the other mushrooms that I found in Southern California. And then um, we'll see some of the other uh, psilocybin mushrooms from all over North America. So uh, psilocybin mushrooms have a tryptamine called psilocybin. And um, that uh, activates the 5-HT2A receptor. And psilocybin is a prodrug for psilocin. So it turns into psilocin in your blood. And then you also have baocystin and norbeocystin. Um, OK, so they're really close molecularly to serotonin, uh, but all these tryptamines. So serotonin is another tryptamine that's in your brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, baocystin is also in the psilocybin mushrooms and norbeocystin. So nobody really knows if baocystin and norbeocystin modify the effects at all, or if it's just psilocybin, um, actually psilocin, making the effect. Um, that's something we would like to be able to figure out, but you know, schedule one, all this stuff, so it's pretty hard to figure it out legally. But there's another kind of psychoactive mushroom, and that's Amanita muscaria and those uh, related species. And those have a completely different molecule, muscarin. So first, we'll see those. This is Amanita muscaria. You got your t-shirt, right? Yep, got it on my t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> and um, this one's really common under pine and occasionally some other trees like birch. And so Amanita muscaria has a completely different effect than psilocybin. Um, here's some Amanita muscaria that I found near Mexico City, where it's really common in the volcanoes that surround Mexico City. Um, and then you have Amanita xylenovulva. It has the same drug. It also has muscamol. And this one is all over southern Mexico. And uh, Amanita species C17 hasn't been named yet, but this is what we call Amanita pantherina in California. So this one, um, there's several species going under the name Amanita pantherina in California, but actually the real pantherina is only in Europe. And then Amanita aprica is up in the mountains. So you might see this in the San Bernardino Mountains or um, up by Mount Shasta. It's all you know, really high elevation. And it comes up in the spring. So all these have muscamol in them. So muscamol is a completely different effect. And it's, um, it's kind of unpleasant, so they haven't bothered to ban it yet, and they probably never will, because you kind of punish yourself when you take it. Um, <laughs> though I don't really mind it. Usually when I eat them, I just fry them up and only eat like four or five bites, and then nothing happens, and they're just delicious. But if you eat like 10 bites, then it feels like you drank a couple beers, but you also feel really sleepy. And then like half my friends that I, that I feed them to, they all, they, half of them like throw up. So it's really common to get nausea. And then if you eat a lot more than that, it gets really unpleasant. It's kind of like taking way too much Xanax, where you black out. And um, so it affects the GABA system, just like alcohol. And it's not a very pleasant drug. So I've given it to a lot of people, and maybe two in five enjoyed it, and maybe one in 20 want to take it again. <laughs> so you can just order them on the internet. Um, occasionally, people microdose them, but they don't seem to have like, the really beneficial effects of microdosing that the psilocybin has. Um, so it's a very different molecule with very different effects. So Amanita pantherina always has this collar on the base of the stem, and that's how you can recognize that. The deadly ones look really similar, but they have different uh, base of the stems. Um, so psilocybin mushrooms. If you just go out and try to find them, probably about 1% of mushrooms have psilocybin in them. And then 1% of mushrooms are deadly, maybe 20% are, are poisonous, and like 60% uh, or so are edible, and another 20% are just too tough to eat or too, too bitter. So to find psilocybin mushrooms, what you have to do is research where they grow in your area, and then uh, wait till it rains, like now, and then go to the correct habitat, the right time of year. A question there? Yeah, roughly 20% are poisonous, but that really varies like on what habitat you're in. Like in December in California, sometimes the most common mushroom is the death cap, which is like, kill you. And that can be like everywhere. But then a month later, it'll be almost gone. 
So it totally varies, but on average, about 20% are poisonous. So they're not as dangerous as most people think. Um, but then again, there's plenty of deadly mushrooms. Um, right now, the deadly mushroom that's super common in this area is called Amanita ocreata, and it grows under coast live oak. And if you eat it, nothing happens for 12 hours, and then you get really sick and you die in a week. <laughs> and you can, um, there's no antidote really, but uh, milk thistle helps a little bit, but you can get your liver replaced, but the new liver is $800,000 with installation. <laughs> so to find psilocybin, yep, so, go ahead. Are there distinctions in, in uh, being able to tell this 20% from the, the good 80%? So identifying mushrooms is really easy, but it's hard at first. It's really no different than learning a foreign language. So if you can learn Chinese, you can learn to identify mushrooms. <laughs> but there's, real, there's no shortcuts for identifying mushrooms. You just have to learn what the mushroom is, and then um, you'll know if it's poisonous or not just by knowing what it is. Oh, just like study enough. <laughs> and I'll, I'll show you some good places to do that. <laughs> so I keep a track of this list of like which psilocybin mushrooms grow in your area. And so there are um, this all 50 states in every country in the world. So you can just look up any country, any state, and figure out which psilocybin mushrooms grow there. And then you can look on websites like iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer to see exactly where they grow. These websites even have coordinates on them. You can see what kind of substrate. And you can get your own mushrooms identified. And I'll show you those. In a little bit. But once you know which mushrooms that are in your area and where to go to find them, you just go if it's been raining and you will see them there. How many days after a rain? So it really depends, but it's been raining a lot, so pretty much any time is good. But if it's totally dry, it'll take a couple of weeks for stuff to come up after a rain. But if it's been raining a bunch, then you know just a few days, maybe four or five days. But it really depends on the species of mushroom. So uh, mushroom identification is pretty easy. Um, but you got to be careful, just like, just like anything. So when you identify mushrooms, you usually want to take pictures of it. So you take a good picture of the top, but even more important, the bottom, the underside. Because a lot of mushrooms look the same from the top, but the underside, the gills and the stem, is where the mushrooms really look different. And you want to bring them home so you can like, study them at home and like, look at them carefully, see how they change over the next day or two. You can make a spore print, so you take the mushroom, drop it on tin foil, and in the morning it'll drop all the spores out of the gills and you can see the color of the spores, which is pretty helpful sometimes. And then a really cool website is Mushroom Observer, and on Mushroom Observer you can upload all your pictures of mushrooms and everyone will vote on what kind of mushroom you have. So <laughs> if you have good photos, you'll get a really accurate identification. And the people in Mushroom Observer are really good, like the guys that write all the mushroom books and the field guys, they're all on there. And, they see everything that comes across. So you get a really good identification there. And then another one is iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is real cool because it's not just mushrooms. You can do plants, trees, birds, animals, any li living thing. Um, and also it has an app. So you can just run this app on your phone. And every time, you, like anytime I see a plant and I don't know what that plant is, I take a picture with iNaturalist. And then you know, uploads and the plant identification experts tell me what plant I have. It works for mushrooms too, but it's not nearly as good as Mushroom Observer as far as the, a lot of the stuff in iNaturalist doesn't get identified because there's just so much of it. Um, but just try both ways and you get a real good answer. And then you also have the Shroomery, which is the world's largest magic mushroom uh, website. And there's an identification forum so people can like, discuss all the magic mushrooms. And for California, there's these official Bay Area California threads. So whenever people find you know, psilocybin mushrooms in California, they'll all post it in one thread, and you can just check this forum to see how the psilocybin mushroom season is doing in California. Um, and then there's a lot of Facebook groups. So the best one for California is called the California Mushroom Identification Forum, and that's where all the experts are. But there's a bunch of other ones, like this Mushroom ID Forum, which is worldwide. So these Facebook groups, you just post your pictures on Facebook, and people tell you exactly which mushroom you have, assuming your pictures are good. And crowdsourcing it like this is a real good idea because one person can easily be wrong, but everybody won't be wrong. <laughs> so here's Mushroom Observer. And you can see these are just all the different observations. So I upload every picture I take of mushrooms onto Mushroom Observer. And I think I have about 30,000 from Mexico and about 10,000 from California on there. And that way I can never lose my photos. When I lose my computer, you know, they're still online, the original photos and that keeps the, you know, the GPS coordinates, and then everybody tells me what kind of mushrooms I have. So maybe I think I know, but it's good to have everybody else double check that. And then it's just like a really good record. So I can just search for any mushroom. Like I say, I want to find Amanita muscaria, and I wonder where they grow. 
I'll just put in Amanita muscaria and I can pull up a map and there'll be these little dots and you can zoom in and see exactly, just any species of mushroom, you can see exactly where it's been found. And then when you find mushrooms, it gets added to the database and then you can, um, you know, everybody gets to see, you know, your finds on the map. So going into one of these, um, here I do an advanced search for Silasibe, Silasibe, however we want to pronounce it. Latin's a dead language, so there's no correct way to pronounce all these, <laughs> all these scientific names. So they actually pronounce it differently in every country, like in Mexico, they say Silasibe. Here, I say Silasibe, but I just say that because that's the way Paul Stamets pronounces it. Um, there's no like, correct way. Um, so say it however you want. But what I did is a search of Silasibe for California. And that pulled up all of the psilocybin mushrooms. Yes, all the psilocybin. So it's not all the psilocybin mushrooms, but everything in the genus psilocybin, which is most of them. And you can see what's really popular right now in California is psilocybin eleni. And we'll see more of that now. But you can like, click on all these and see the habitats where they found and all that kind of stuff. So what I did is I clicked on the map. And you can see that um, these are all the psilocybin finds in California. And you can see they're really concentrated along the coast. And there's a ton of them in the Bay Area. And then there's also some in Los Angeles. And that's partially because the Bay Area has more humidity, so more mushrooms. But also, there's more mushroom hunters and more people using these websites in the Bay Area. But you can see they're pretty well distributed um, all the way from San Diego, all up through Los Angeles, and um, really all the way up the coast. So if you're looking for psilocybin mushrooms in California, you don't want to go into the mountains because you'll never find them up there. Um, they're really coastal things. Um, so here I am kind of zooming in on the Bay Area. You can see they're just uh, all over the place. And here's the same thing on iNaturalist. Um, again, they're really coastal. And uh, here's the mushroom identification forum on Facebook. Um, this particular forum has like 140,000 people on there. So you get an answer real fast. So psilocybin mushrooms are pretty easy to identify because all of them follow this rule. And that is that all mushrooms have a black or dark purple brown spore print and stained blue wear damaged are psilocybin mushrooms. Now you also have some psilocybin mushrooms that are different color spore prints um, that don't follow this rule, but there's nothing that's poisonous and there's nothing that's inactive that follows this rule. So pretty much uh, almost all of them follow this rule. So make sure it stains blue, wear damaged. And that means like where you beat it up, where you break the cells, it should turn blue there. Um, and then for the spore print, you just take a cap and leave it on tin foil overnight and you'll see the color in the morning. You usually don't have to do that. Usually you can figure out the spore print color without actually doing that because the gills start out like cream colored and then they change color to whatever color the spores are. So as you notice the mushrooms maturing and notice how the gills change color as the mushrooms develop, um, that'll tell you the spore print color without actually having to make a spore print. So there's uh, several genera of psilocybin mushrooms. You've got Copalandia, Gallerina, Gymnopilus, Inosibi, Paneolus, Foliotina, Pluteus, and Psilocybe. So uh, the vast majority are in Psilocybe. But the most common psilocybin mushroom in Southern California is Paneolus cinctulus, and we'll see that in a minute. So here's all the different uh, psilocybin mushrooms in North America. Um, you see there's quite a few of them. Uh, about half of these only occur in Mexico. So Psilocybe cubensis is the most common psilocybin mushroom. It does not grow in the wild in California because it needs warm summer rains, but it's super easy to cultivate. So anytime you buy psilocybin mushrooms in the black market, 99% of the time it's Psilocybe cubensis, which was described in 1906 from Cuba, but it's actually native to Asia. So here's the map of where it grows. You can see it gets real common so in southern Mexico, and then it's all over Texas and parts of Oklahoma, and Florida, and um, Louisiana, and Georgia. Uh, but you can see it's totally absent on the West Coast outside of hippies' closets, uh, <laughs> where it's super common. Um, so whenever you order spores online, these are like, super easy to grow. It's just as easy to grow as all those mushrooms in the farmer's market. So here's one that I found in Michoacan. Uh, before it opens up, you can see it looks real cool. It's got this veil here. And, um, it's one of the few psilocybin mushrooms that has a ring on the stem. And then these purple spores fall out of the cap and they fall on the ring, so it makes a purple ring. And in nature, it's always found on cow manure. So this is uh, some cow dung that I found in uh, Veracruz, Mexico. And um, 
you can see it's, you know, it's real, real big, real cool looking. It's not that potent, um, which is both good and bad because you don't want like, people to go co totally crazy off just eating a couple of them. Um, and this is one of those caterpillars that stings you if you touch it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, super easy to cultivate. So you can see they come out just like crazy. And it takes about two months to do a full grow cycle. So um, you can order spores online. The spores are technically illegal in California, but the California spore law has never been enforced. So if you're in California, the best place to get spores is just to trade for them on Facebook. And there's a, <laughs> there's a bunch of Facebook groups like the Psilocybin Spore Print Traders Den and the Myco Marketplace. And so if you try to buy spores, a lot of those companies follow all the laws, so they won't ship them to California. But if you trade for them on Facebook, you have no trouble getting people to mail you spores. And I, nobody's ever gotten in trouble for having spores in California. If you get busted growing mushrooms, you get three years supervised probation, which sucks, uh, but at least you're not going to jail. But you know, they don't really get you for um, you know, having spores. They just, uh, if they find something and they test it with uh, gas chromatography, run you through the system. If it tests positive, you get convicted. It's, um, it's hopefully a system that's going to change. Um, so we're working on psilocybin legalization in Oakland right now. And we're just starting that. And if, it, if we can get it legalized in Oakland, then we'll, we'll go for the whole state. So probably in four or eight years, it won't be illegal anymore in California. Um, and we'll definitely need a lot of help gathering signatures. And so stay tuned for that. Um, here's what they look like dried. So this is what, what you'll see at Grateful Dead shows. They're um, pretty. <laughs> They're really pretty easy to identify dried. Um, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but the blue stains, the blue staining is persistent. So a lot of mushrooms that stain blue that are not psilocybin mushrooms, the blue goes away when it dries, but here the blue stain stays. And also you can see the spore color, you know, they have the dark purple brown spores and they have the ring on a lot of them. And um, the stem is kind of like fat and puffy. So these are really distinctive looking and even dried, they're pretty hard to mistake for any other mushroom. Dry them, what I do is I just leave them on dashboard in my car, but that's Mexico where you can get away with that. Um, here, the best way is a food dehydrator, um, but you can also leave a fan on them, but the most important thing is to get them cracker dry. So if you bend the, if you bend the mushroom and it snaps, that's good. If it's, just, if it's kind of bendy and it doesn't snap like a cracker, then it's not dry enough. And so if you dry it cracker dry, they'll stay potent for a very long time, like longer than you'll, you'll live. Um, Yep. Do you keep your dried ones just in a like dark, dry place, or do you put them in the freezer? Like, so everything lasts longer in the freezer, yeah. but they'll last 20 years easy, even at room temperature, if they're properly dried. Um, but if you put it in the freezer, you want to make sure you warm them up before you open up the jar, because you get condensation, and the water is really what get, you know, which de decreases the potency. Um, so I just keep mine at room temperature, and I think that's fine. Yeah? Uh, uh, do you, when you're growing them, do you ever put intention behind you know, they do an ayahuasca and they do everything with intention and it has a difference. So you think with the mushrooms you can pray upon them. I don't think so. <laughs> um, I think it's just the, you know, the psilocybin's a molecule and it doesn't matter if it comes from a mushroom or if it's synthesized in the lab, it's the same molecule. But certainly you f you'll feel differently about your mushrooms uh, if you put intention behind them. So that'll affect the trip a lot for sure. So. It'll certainly do something, but I don't think the mushrooms really notice no. the intention that you put into them. Um, but I've actually never grown mushrooms, um, not a single one. I just find them outside because I'm always mushroom hunting like every day and I find way more than I could ever eat. Um, but, they're, um, but for most people, it's easier to grow them for sure. Um, so these are what the spores look like. They're really big. And here's the habitat. <laughs> So there's actually, there were more of them. They formed a whole half circle around me. Um, cow, cows are really nice, fortunately. This is your factory, right? Yeah, that was in Michoacan. Are, are those cows high? No, I, I, think, I don't think so. Um, so Psilocybe ovodiocystidiata is um, one of the more common psilocybin mushrooms that you'll find here in Southern California. And the reason they get common in Southern California is they don't need like the cold snap. Um, some of the other psilocybin mushrooms, they need to be really cold to fruit. Whereas Psilocybe ovodiocystidiata, it fruits whenever it rains. So it could be any time of the year that rain comes around or any time of the year that you water your patch outside in your backyard. Some people even grow them like in flower pots along with their plants. Um, but this is one of the more recently discovered psilocybin mushrooms from North America, described in 2007 
by Gaston Guzman and Richard Gaines, and these grow in wood chip landscaping. So if you want to find them, you look for wood chips, but not just a few wood chips, you look for thousands of wood chips. A lot of people look on Google Earth to see, like, uh, you can find like, massive places where you can get a lot of wood chips. This is Richard Gaines, who discovered Psilocybe ovoide sustidata, and Gaston Guzman, who's um, picking Psilocybe mexicana here, but he's um, he passed away a couple years ago, but he was the world expert in psilocybin mushrooms, and he described a whole lot of species. And he was a professor um, in Veracruz. Can you repeat his name? Gaston Guzman. And so here is uh, the paper that got named Psilocybe ovoidea cystidiana. So if you discover a new mushroom and you want to name it, you publish a scientific paper and it gets past peer review, and then people have to use that name forever. <laughs> and here is the distribution map. <coughs> You can see it grows all the way up and down the west coast. The furthest south here is in Balboa Park. And, uh, and then it's described from Ohio, but it grows all over um, east coast, even up into Georgia. And here's some that I found a couple weeks ago in Pacifica. <coughs> and here's some I found in my backyard in Mountain View like five years ago. And after a few days, um, you see they start to get like really light on the cap. So the cap starts out like really dark caramel color. And as it dries out, it gets light. And then it has this annulus on the stem. It's actually really closely related to Psilocybe cubensis. And sometimes, like if it gets bitten by frost, you'll, you'll break all the cells and make the bluing get really dramatic. And here's some. Um, I, I mailed a spore print to Switzerland, and this guy just uh, got the spore print in the mail, swiped it onto auger, fired up a culture, and put them into wood chips and grew thousands of them all over in Switzerland. So here's a picture that he sent. And then he even found them miles away from uh, where he planted them, so maybe they're spreading. Wow. A little bit. Um, you know, a lot of mushroom, a lot of psilocybin mushrooms have a pretty viscid cap, but this one is not super slimy. Uh, you wouldn't really notice it. In fact, if it's not like raining or wet, it's, it's kind of a dry cap. But if you like feel it, it's like almost like a, like, a, like a little bit buttery. It's kind of vaguely slimy. And ovoidea cystidiata was named because of the ovoid cystidia, which are cells on the gills. So you can see um, in the middle, that's the ovoid cystidia that they named it after. So Psilocybe eleni uh, is named in 2012 by Jan Borovicka, Alan Rockefeller, and Peter Werner, um, described from the University of Washington campus. And this has never been found in its native habitat, so nobody knows where it's native to, but it gets really common in the Bay Area. Um, it was found one time in the Los Angeles area, in Malibu, and this one can get really aggressive. And so here's the paper that I published um, with uh, Jan Borvichka and Peter Werner, which named this species. And, go ahead. So here's the distribution map, again, all along the west coast. Doesn't grow very much inland at all. And it can get really prolific. So these, um, this patch I found right alongside of Highway 101, where they put down all the wood chips. And it may have grown there because uh, like a year before I took this picture, I found some in Oakland. And I just put some of the old fruit bodies in a water bottle and shook it up really good, and then dumped the water <laughs> on the fresh wood chips. So that's like um, really easy, non-sterile cultivation that you can do. Um, you know, usually cultivation requires a pressure cooker and grain spawn and sterile, completely, complete sterility. But you can just take like, the, um, if you just grab one of the mushrooms and pinch off the stem base, you can plant that stem base in fresh wood chips. And then after a couple of years, the wood chips kind of turn gray. And that's um, when, when the wood chips have turned gray, that's when you look for the mushrooms. Um, but it's too late to be planting spores and mycelium. So this spot here, it was like uh, about 80 feet long, and it took about four hours to pick them all. Um, and then this one here was from one of those yuppie apartment complexes um, that sprung up all over Oakland. And the reason that grew so many of them here is because they irrigate it. So the irrigation in the summer, it keeps it colonizing. And that way, when the temperature drops in the fall, they all just fruit at once. And there was just like thousands of them that came up um, just right in, the, in front of this apartment complex. And you can see, yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. And these are really strong. They're like three times as strong as Psilocybe cubensis. <laughs> and um, here's some that I found in my backyard. What did you mean by aggressive? Did you just mean it's really strong or 
right? Yeah, like sometimes, like when they fruit, there'll be thousands of them and just take over the wood chip patch. And also, like this uh, mycelium, it ties together all the wood chips and just like really aggressively turns the wood chips back into dirt. And that's good because they can like outcompete other mushrooms, but it's bad because they eat all the wood chips really quickly. So your patch will be dis disappear in a couple years unless you keep feeding it new wood chips. So like at the end of the season, like February, usually you want to put fresh wood chips. You can get it from the store or usually you can get them from a tree trimming place and just cover them with fresh wood chips and keep feeding it. And that way the patch will keep living there. So I picked all the caps off of that patch and put them on tin foil here and let them overnight. And in the morning I got spore prints. And so um, these spore prints, I uh, put them in the brand new Ziploc bags, which keep them sterile. And then I dropped them all in the mail. So I put like a thousand of them in the mail this year. And um, that, that way when people get them, um, they can just w wipe those onto auger and fire up a culture. Uh, Psilocybe cyanescens is another psilocybin mushroom that grows along the west coast. And it was described by L.C. Wakefield in 1946 from the United Kingdom. But it's probably native to Oregon and Washington. And uh, you can see, again, it really likes the coastal foggy areas. And they call these wavy caps because um, the caps get really wavy once they mature. And the stems are, are really white and they stain blue really dramatically wherever you scratch them. And here's some mature ones. They always get this really nice shape. And sometimes they get really prolific. Um, like here's a picture from Germany and there's just maybe 10,000 of them in this photo. And these are extremely strong too. Um, like Maybe a gram to a gram and a half dried is one pretty strong dose. Uh, Peniola cinctulus is the most common psilocybin mushroom in Southern California. And the reason for that is because it uh, really likes warm weather. And this was the first psilocybin mushroom ever described. Uh, 1792 they named it. And, the, um, and that was named from Europe, but it's the exact same thing here. Uh, why does it not most begin the Latin name with uh, psilocybin? So this one is not in psilocybe. So psilocybe is a genus. But there's like eight different genera that have psilocybin in them. Um, and so the chemical was named after the genus psilocybe. But then later they discovered it in the, these other genera too. So you can see it's really widespread. Paniola cinctulus grows in all 50 states and every country in the world. And the habitat is really unique. So the other ones that we've seen so far, the wood chip mushrooms, they only grow in wood chip landscaping. But these here, they mostly are found in people's lawns. So especially when you look for the really green lawns because that means they've been watering a lot so the greener the better and they don't fruit right now they fruit when it gets warmer so they fruit like maybe april may they get really common um, but they can be super common like in the san diego area like almost in every other lawn and there can be thousands of them in a lawn too and so um yeah that's definitely the most common one here and then they also grow in horse manure so when you have a stable they usually pile up the horse manure and they um, you know, have these massive piles, and sometimes there'll be thousands of Peniola cinctulus growing out of those horse manure piles. Yep. Um, when you're picking them from a lawn, do you worry about like fertilizers? Uh, I don't, because the fertilizers are not that poisonous. And um, it's not like edible mushrooms, because edible mushrooms, you, know, you eat like a couple hundred grams for dinner, and then you eat them every day for dinner. But these, you eat maybe one or two grams. And so the amount is really small, and you're usually not eating them every day. So I don't. <laughs> yeah. So I don't. I don't think there's really going to be that much problem with like fertilizers and stuff. And also, you know, fertilizers aren't really going to build up. The only thing you really got to worry about is heavy metals. So if it's you know, if you're always picking them from the same spot and that spot is contaminated with heavy metals, that could be a problem. But if you're picking it from all sorts of different spots, even if you get a little bit of contamination, it probably won't build up or do anything. So you can see it's really widely distributed and it grows all over the place. Um, and I found them like in front of, like in the police station lawns and just <laughs> all over. So you said it likes warm, uh, warm yeah. areas. Does that mean it will fruit later? Yeah. Like in the summer? Yeah, like in August. Okay. And then down, you know, like th this far south will probably fruit pretty much whenever just because it can be pretty warm. But the last couple of weeks have been really cold, so I'd be really surprised if you find them right now. But as soon as it warms up a little bit, especially if the rains keep up, or if the rains don't keep up, just chuck the irrigated lawns. Um, you'll definitely find them. And you know, sometimes people will pick a thousand of them off of one lawn. They can get really common. Um, can you eat them? 
Yeah. No, they're they're perfectly good fresh. In fact, they're a little bit stronger fresh because the psilocin kind of breaks down a little bit when it gets dried. So some of it breaks down. Um, but if you eat them fresh, they can hurt your stomach a little bit more. So I think um, maybe it's a good idea to cook them or make tea. You can toss them in boiling water. Um, but I like to cook them because they taste really good cooked. All the psilocybin mushrooms taste really good cooked. And it doesn't lose any potency with the heat from cooking because um, the chemicals are really pretty stable. Um, but tossing them into boiling water is probably the best way because then it absorbs faster and then you don't actually have to eat the mushroom. You know, the alkaloids are super water soluble. So, um, you know, they dissolve really quickly in hot water. So you'll get just as full a dose out of a tea yeah. as you would with the same dry sample? Uh-huh. And then if you eat the, you know, the mushrooms from the bottom of the teacup later, you won't feel anything. Hmm. Oh. So you don't... Yeah. No. And you only have to steep them, correct? You don't have to actually boil them. I usually like to boil them just because if there's any bacteria, you know, it kills the bacteria and, you know, it doesn't seem to harm the psilocybin to boiling. But, you know, even cold water tea would work just fine because it's really stable or really soluble. But also, um, you know, if you can break the mushrooms up a little bit, you could throw them in a blender, you could powder them if they're dry, you know, that'll make them dissolve even faster. But they dissolve pretty fast uh, anyway. How long do you keep them in a boil usually? Uh, I think a couple minutes is fine. It doesn't really take that long at all. So you can see they have jet black spores. So there's no poisonous mushrooms with jet black spores. And um, they have this kind of reddish stem. And you can see the stem has longitudinal, longitudinal striations in it. And it looks really powdery. So if you look at it up close, especially at the, near the top, it looks like there's real fine powder on the stem. And the stem is real fragile. Like you just bend it a little bit and it snaps. And it snaps really easily. And does it bruise purple? Just barely. So this mushroom has a lot more psilocybin than psilocin. Psilocybin doesn't give you any blue staining at all, whereas the psilocin is the less stable chemical that gives you blue staining. So if I pick like a hundred of these, um, I'll see blue staining just in the stem base on maybe five of them. Um, so for this, you don't really look for the blue staining. You more just get to know what the mushroom looks like. And it's pretty distinctive and there's nothing poisonous that looks like it. Could you give an explanation of the difference between those two chemicals that you just shared? So psilocybin is um, a pretty stable chemical, and it's basically a psilocin molecule, which is basically a DMT molecule. They're all super similar. But you know, both of them are orally active, so it's like DMT that you can eat. And the psilocybin turns into psilocin in your body, so that phosphoryl group gets dropped and turns into psilocin, and then psilocin is what can cross your blood-brain barrier to get into your brain and cause the psychoactive effect. So you can see on Paniolus, um, the gills have this mottled look because the spores all mature at different times. So that's kind of something distinctive you see in Paniolus that you don't see in a lot of other things. And you can kind of see the, uh, the stem here, how it's kind of uh, powdery at the top. And then the gills start out cream colored, but by the time they mature, they turn charcoal black. Um, another one that's pre it's really common in Southern California, all over California really, is the Gymnopolis thirsii. And uh, this one's maybe with the most beautiful psilocybin mushroom, uh, but it's not very potent. I think one time I ate nine grams dried, and I did see colors, but next time maybe I'll try 15. <laughs> so here's the paper that des uh, described uh, Gymnopolis thirsii. It was published in 19 1989. It was written up in a typewriter. And um, here's some coming out of some wood chips that I found in Santa Cruz. And this particular spot had thousands of them. I could have gotten 50 pounds of this if I wanted. Um, it was right along Highway 9 in Santa Cruz where they chipped up a pine tree. And they start out bright purple. And then um, here's some from right by my house in Oakland. Um, you can see they have orange spores. So that means that the gills, they start, the gills start out yellow and then the gills turn bright orange. Uh, when the spores mature, and also these are spores here just kind of settling on the annulus. Yep. And so these I found way out in the middle of nature. Um, you know, most psilocybin mushrooms in California that grow in man made habitats, but this is one that you can find way out in the middle of the woods, um, and that's pretty rare. Uh, there's another one that looks just like it Gymnopolis, and uh, this one I think it might be Gymnopolis dilepis. And so it looks a lot like Gymnopolis thirsii, 
In California, all of our gymnopolis species that have psilocybin have these red caps that have like uh, red fibers on them. Uh, but this one's a lot smaller. So you can see it's, um, the cap never gets much bigger than this. Uh, there's a lot of lookalikes, and if you really pay attention, you won't find, there won't really be any lookalikes because nothing looks the same exactly. Um, but if you're just kind of new to it, there's a bunch of stuff that kind of looks like psilocybin mushrooms that are not exactly. So here's uh, Cortinaris violaceus. It's a beautiful mushroom, and this is a very purple mushroom. So psilocybin mushrooms aren't really purple, they're blue. And no matter how much you beat up this mushroom, it won't turn any blue or won't get any more purple. And that's how you know it's not a psilocybin mushroom. But this is edible. And it tastes like leaves. And it has <laughs> orange spores, so the flash catches the spores, makes it look really cool. And then here's an entheloma. Um, this one, also, no matter how much you beat it up, it won't turn any more blue. Uh, another entheloma, this one has a really cool cobalt blue color, and I found it in Veracruz. Um, also, does not stain. Here's one that looks just like Psilocybe cubensis, almost, but it's super common. Uh, I guess really common in the spring. It's called Loridiomyces reparius. And so this mushroom is in like every city park in every person's yard, like April, May. Um, you'll see it a million times. And it's edible, but not hallucinogenic. It's got dark purple-brown spores, so the same spore print color as Psilocybe. Will that... Um Turn blue if you... No, nope. so all these lookalikes that look like psilocybin mushrooms, they will not turn blue at all. Here's a picture that I took in Felicita Park just like four days ago. And um, so you can see it looks kind of like psilocybin cubensis, but not really. It's, um, it's more straw colored and you won't really find cubensis in California anyway. Is the blue dyeing a specific psilocybin mushroom? Um, it's psilocin, so all psilocybin mushrooms have at least some psilocin. And it's the psilocin that breaks down and turns into this blue color. I think it's like uh, two psilocin molecules break down and bond together to make an indo molecule. Um, so, but yeah, all of them will have the same shade. This one is called Loratiomyces series. It's got dark purple brown spore print. And the cool thing about this mushroom is it grows in the same habitat as these wood chip mushrooms that have psilocybin. So this, uh, when people are looking for psilocybin mushrooms, often they'll just like ride the bikes around, look real fast at the wood chip beds, and if they see these bright red mushrooms, then they stop and look more closely for the, dark, the brown mushrooms. Here's Agrosibi pediates, and this one is super common in wood chip landscaping, and is edible. Paniolus phonosecchii is super common in lawns, and this is um, the lookalike for Paniolus cinctulus. So Paniola cinctulus has jet black spores, and this has very dark brown spores. So this one's edible, but you can see the gills are brown, and they never get totally black. Um, so if you eat these, nothing happens uh, at all. You just get a little bit less hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and it's super common. It's in every single lawn. Uh, this one is Paniolus antirum, and this one um, looks a lot like Copalandia cyanescens. Uh, this one is in every single lawn right now as uh, Agrosibi pediates. It's edible and it tastes like cucumber. And we found about 100 of these on our mushroom hunt yesterday. Uh, Parasola oricoma, uh, Parasola conopilia. Um, it looks like a psilocybin mushroom, but it's super fragile. And you touch it and it just like breaks, like in the cap breaks into triangular pieces, the stem splinters. It practically breaks just by barely picking it up. All the psilocybin mushrooms are a lot more durable. Like you can like take the, take the stem and tie it in a knot around your finger and like they won't break very much. Um, Satharella bipelis is also super fragile and edible. And then uh, Mycena amicta, the base of the stem is really like a beautiful sky blue, but it doesn't really stain blue, it's just that color. Uh, but really cool looking thing. Uh, but it's got white spores, there's no psilocybin mushrooms with white spores. And then Nolena, this is a picture that I took in Baja, California, just a couple days ago. Little brown mushroom with pink spores, um, unknown edibility. And then here's Tuberia furfuracea. This is the edible lookalike to the deadly gallerina. And it looks a lot like Psilocybe cyanescens or something, but it's got orange spores, whereas Psilocybe has purple spores, so the gills turn orange. Um, I think a lot of hippies accidentally eat this trying to get high, and nothing happens. <laughs> But this one is the deadly gallerina, so this one has the same uh, toxins as gallerina marginata. Um, oh, this one is gallerina marginata, same toxins as the death cap. So if you eat it, nothing happens for 12 hours, then you get really sick and you die in a week. 
and you'll occasionally find it in wood chip landscaping right next to the psilocybin mushrooms. What you really have to pay attention to is how the gills change color over time. So the gills turn orange because the spores are orange. And um, the gills will never turn orange on a psilocybin mushroom unless it's gymnopolis, which are a lot bigger than this. Foliotina rugosa has this big ring, and it's also deadly poisonous and grows in the same habitat as your uh, psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, again, orange spores. And also orange spores, Foliotina rugosa again. So um, here I'll show you a bunch of mushrooms that I found this past week because I've been mushroom hunting every day the past week. And these are just what you're going to come across if you look around here for mushrooms. Parasola auricoma. And Bulbidius titubans is edible and super common. Uh, Vulvaputeus gloriocephalus is super common. You've all seen this mushroom a thousand times. And it's very big and it's got pink spores and it's edible. And Folia spumosa grows on wood chips, doesn't stain blue. Uh, Sturium herzunum is on like every single log in the forest. You'll see it a million times a day. Uh, this is Bletus amygdalinus, now in Swilelis. It's a good edible. It stains blue when you cut it open, a beautiful sky blue. But if you cook it or dry it, the blue goes away. And here's some earth stars. They're kind of like puffball things. And uh, Tricholoma dryophyllum smells like cucumber. And here's a Hygrophorus. That's an edible that grows under coast live oak. And here's an Inoctobi, which is poisonous and also grows with coast live oak. And a Pisolithus, like a dead man's foot, they call it. Um, really good dye mushroom. has a ton of color in it. You can use it to dye fabric and make paintings. And here's an Agaricus that smells like uh, licorice and is edible. And here's a Bolete. This is... Uh, Oreo it grows under coast live oak. It tastes like lemon, good edible. And then Cantomyces rosellus is super common in open areas. And candy caps that grow under coast live oak and they smell like maple syrup. They're really good for making desserts. And then here's another candy type of candy cap, is Lactarius rufulus. It has less of a maple flavor, but it's more bright red, also with coast live oak. And Merasmius albogrisius gets really common in uh, Southern California. It's edible. And then this is Leuco agaricus amanitoides. It looks just like an amanita, but it's actually Leuco agaricus. And amanita calyptotoides is a good edible. Amanita ocreata is deadly poisonous. It's just like a death cap. And more ocreata. It's, amanita ocreata has that, uh, the really bulbous, uh, really bulbous base at the stem. So that lets you know that it's the deadly poisonous group. And uh, Amanita, this is a brand new species of Amanita that has no name yet, but it stains red where damaged and is a really good edible. And that's the same thing. Amanita velosa is the world's most delicious edible mushroom. It grows under coast live oak, it smells like shrimp, and it tastes like scallops. Yes? So, <laughs> so you say it hasn't been identified, but it's an edible. Yeah. Um, uh, well, what's the typical procedure for distinguishing, oh, this is edible, because I guess... Well, we got, blind, yeah, we got DNA sequences from these things, okay. and so what I do is I put the DNA sequence into blast and blast it and then build a phylogenetic tree, and all the poisonous mushrooms all stick together in clades, and all the edible mushrooms stick together in clades. So this came out in the middle of all the edible mushrooms, so I know that it's edible. All right, thank yep. You. What was that one called again? Sorry. Amanita velosa, and this next one also is Amanita velosa. Uh, um, question. Have yep. you ever found any... Yeah, you do. In, in Southern California, there's two kinds of morels. One of them grows in wood chip landscaping any time of the year. The other kind grows up in the San Bernardino Mountains around Mother's Day. And so uh, if you go with the uh, San Diego Mycological Society, they'll have a bunch of forays around Mother's Day weekend. And you can go pick morels all day. All right, next. So Havela dryophila looks kind of like morels, grows under oak. Next. And here's an inosibi that's poisonous. And Lactarius alnicola, this is a picture I took at night with my cell phone light, but this one's super peppery, and it tastes like a habanero pepper. And then here's a desert mushroom, Podoxus pistillaris. And um, this grows way out in the middle of the desert, pretty common around here. Here's the world's strongest psilocybin mushroom, Psilocybe azurescens, only grows in Washington and Oregon. And Psilocybe azurescens, you know, Aztecorum, um, it was described from Mexico, but this I found in Arizona, and it's also found it, it's in Canada as well. Yep. Uh, the previous mushroom, what was that again? That was Psilocybe azurescens. That, that seems to 
familiar. Is that the one that Paul Stamets recommended? Yeah, he, he's the one that named this one. He named it after his son. Do you, do you know why he picked that besides the strength? Uh, he's just really strong, and he's the one that named it, so he's partial to it. So now we have a whole lot of pictures to go through really fast, so we'll try to flip through them as quick as we can. Um, this is the habitat of Psilocybe Aztecorum in Arizona, and more Aztecorum from Mexico, more from Mexico, and also Mexico. And then we have the Psilocybe, yep, also Aztecorum, that's the habitat in Mexico. And here's what the cells on the gill edge look like. And then here's Psilocybe baocystis, um, grows in lawns and also wood chips up in the Oregon and Washington. Next. Um, yep. um, Alan, you yep. can uh, have 10 minutes. Okay, cool. We'll, just, we'll go through these really fast. Yeah. Um, and okay, so baocystis here, yep. And it's pretty cool. It's got this kind of scalloped margin. And then here is some um, uh, Mexican government puts up these nice signs about the landslide. So here's some landslide mushrooms. In Mexico, there's a lot of psilocybin mushrooms that grow in landslides. The Psilocybe serolescens grows in landslides. They call them durumbes. That's the Spanish word for landslide. And more Psilocybe serolescens. And this place is from a place in Jalisco called the Sawmill. And there's thousands of them. There's more than you can possibly carry. There's hundreds of Mexican hippies looking for this place, but nobody's found it yet. <laughs> and there's a spore print on the cap. And we found a whole lot. And this is the habitat that we found it in. And these police are not very good at identifying psilocybin mushrooms <laughs> <laughs> using microscopic features because they didn't arrest us. Uh, so also we said Relipa is described from Michigan, but it was, uh, I found this one in Mexico. Yep. Would psilocybin mushrooms have effects on other animals, for example? Because I saw the dog in picture. Yeah, they do. They, right. Yeah, for sure. And more Psilocybe serolipes. Um, super rare in Mexico, but a lot more common than East Coast of the United States. And here's Alonzo Cortez Perez. He's now the world expert in psilocybin mushrooms. He was guesting Guzman's last student. And here he is photographing Psilocybe serolipes. And um, I go all over Mexico with him looking for psilocybin mushrooms. Yes? Is there a reason that um, psilocybin mushrooms tend to grow in um, places that are not Uh, it's kind of like concentrated food for them because they take all this grass and just kind of concentrate all the lignin in one place. So um, it's really a very small percentage of psilocybin mushrooms that grow in manure. But yeah, there's a, there's a few very common psilocybin species that just do really well in manure. Is there, are there any that grow in other ruminants or is it just parts of the yeah. ruminants? It's mostly horses and cows because that's like concentrated grass feed. Oh, okay. uh, also elephants and water buffalo and stuff like that. Psilocybe cyanofibrillosa is super rare, and it's only been found a couple times. And then Psilocybe hymii um, is found in Mexico. It's super rare as well. It grows in the cloud forests in Oaxaca and Veracruz. And it has kind of orange gills when it's young, and then they turn purple as the spores mature. And then Psilocybe hopii was recently described from uh, the hills above Flagstaff, um, Arizona. Yep. The, the Hopi Indians don't know anything about it, though. They never used it. And then, uh, yep, that's what it looks like. Psilocybe hugshigenii was described for, or was, uh, from Oaxaca. It's got that really cool cap on it. This one took me 10 years to find this mushroom. It's really hard to find. It's also a dudumbe, so it grows on landslides. And I found it a couple times in Sierra Mije, which is a super rare or super remote part of Oaxaca. And here's one that was collected in 1959 by Gordon Wasson, and one from Maria Sabina. And there's the habitat where I found it. This is um, Psilocybe mescalorensis. And this is the guy that discovered Psilocybe mescalorensis. And uh, this only grows in the very high elevations of New Mexico. And this is the habitat that it grows in. Psilocybe mexicana is really potent. And it grows in horse pastures. But it doesn't grow in manure. It grows, grows on grass. And um, it has a really strong cucumber odor, probably stronger than all the other psilocybin mushrooms. And it gets really common early in the season in Mexico. And then Psilocybe malericola grows at really high elevation. This is Popocatepetl, an active volcano that's erupting in this photo. And this is the habitat. It grows on the side of these walls. And uh, this is the best spot I found in Mexico. There's hundreds of them on this wall every time I go. And there they are. 
So this is a, like a really high elevation. They're also a landslide mushroom, so they're growing really high elevation landslides. And they stay in blue pretty good. The picture I took this summer. And they have dark purple brown spores. This is a lot in Mexico. They're illegal. You can't have them. Yeah. The only places you're allowed to have psilocybin mushrooms are Brazil and Jamaica. Psilocybin <laughs> neohalapensis is named after Jalapa. So it gets real common, but way out in the middle of the woods, they don't grow in disturbed areas at all. And purple spores. There's the Alonzo again photographing um, in its native habitat. Um, Psilocybin pelliculosa grows all up and down the west coast, but the furthest south it's ever been found is this photograph here from the Salt Point State Park which is north of San Francisco. And then Psilocybe semi-lanceata is called the Liberty Cap. And this grows all up and down the coast, but only up to um, Eureka, Arcata, no further south. So it really likes cold temperatures. And this is from an elk field up in Orec, California. And then Psilocybe stuntsia, they call it blue ringers. You can actually see the blue ring on there. Um, these also grow in northern California, Oregon, and Washington. And Psilocybe subtropicalis grows with oak in southern Mexico. And this is the habitat. You can see it's really beautiful. A whole bunch of biologists are finding it this summer. And here's some more biologists. <laughs> um, Psilocybe youngensis is really cool looking. Um, grows on rotten wood in southern Mexico. There's photos from Jalisco. And then Psilocybe zapaticorum is the last Psilocybe we have. It's really big and it grows on landslides. And it's one of my favorite ones to photograph. Um, it grows in big clusters, it's super potent. You can see how blue it's turning. It's like, uh, this is from Michoacan where nobody knows about it. But in Oaxaca, it really likes to grow near water. Um, this cluster here, you can see it's, uh, Alonzo found it here. And here's a closer up of it. And then the next one is even closer. It was so pretty that we just left it there. But like an hour later, we found this exact cluster in the back seat of some hippie's car. <laughs> <laughs> And I just pinched the edge, and it stain, they stain really blue. Lots of solosin. And it's from the sawmill in Jalisco. And this is a habitat. It's a super dangerous habitat. This is a landslide. So um, some of the most dangerous mushroom hunting there is. The only more dangerous mushroom hunting you can do is the bioluminescent ones, which glow in the dark, um, which I do a lot of that, too. <laughs> There's a really cool lake in Michoacan. There's Zapatacorum all along the edge of this lake. Um, so then there's some other mushrooms that are not in psilocybe. So, uh, Copalandia cyanescens uh, yep. grows in horse manure. That's from the state of Hidalgo. Yep. And also super easy to cultivate, stains blue a lot. Pineal, pineal, uh, this one, uh, Foliotina smithii, grows up no near Canada. And then Gymnopolis luteus grows all over the East Coast, gets really big. And Plutaeus americanus also it grows, has pink spores, so it's unusual. And Plutea sabe is super rare and unusual. And then the last thing, there's just a few people in the world that study psilocybe. So there's, um, there's Virginia Ramirez. And, um, yep, that's uh, Alonzo Cortez. Oh, yep. Virginia Ramirez, Alonzo Cortez Perez, Laura Guzman, and Jan Borovicka. And so Alonzo and Virginia, um, Virginia did her PhD in the phylogeny of psilocybin mushrooms, so she did all the DNA sequencing. And Alonzo does uh, mostly microscopy. And here is Alonzo photographing psilocybe hymiae this summer. And Laura Guzman is a professor at University of Guadalajara. She's a really amazing mycology teacher, and her students love her. And then Jan Borovicka is, um, works in Czechoslovakia, a real cool guy. Um, and he um, published uh, Psilocybe Alenii with me, and um, just, uh, does a lot of DNA sequencing as well. Uh, I have no idea. I just took that off his Facebook. <laughs> Thank you very much, and maybe we have time for questions. So if you want, you can download this whole talk just um, at that URL there. Uh, right. Yep. Um, do you have a resource for 
like the um, psilocybin and psilocybin content of all these different mushrooms? Because I know they can. They vary a lot. Wildly. There's one guy, Gartz, that did a lot of testing, but he didn't test all the species, and they vary so much that I don't pay a lot of attention to it. Okay. Um, but if you Google for like psilocybin potency chart, you'll see some, there's some charts where they tested yeah, some of them. Yeah, there's one that Paul created and there's uh -huh. like maybe eight of them. Already. Yeah, it's most like, of the species have not been tested. Wow. The bruising that you said, does that happen immediately when you pinch it? It's or? pretty quick and usually when I find a psilocybin mushroom, there's already some blue on it just from environmental damage, bug damage, that kind of stuff. Um, but usually it's within 10, 20 seconds, but sometimes up to like two minutes. If it's kind of drier, it can take a little longer to show up, but if it's a really fresh mushroom, it's really fast. Yep. Uh, when picking mushrooms and, and finding something you might want to eat, are you worried about aphids or insects or anything like uh, that? No, they're all edible. <laughs> I don't worry about it. But if you are worried about it, just toss it in boiling water. Yes? Do all or most poisonous mushrooms have the bulbous? No, it's just the Amanita from that group. Okay. So really, you just got to identify the mushroom, the species. I just post that online. There's so many people online that can identify these things super easy. You know, like when I started, it took me half an hour to identify mushrooms, and now it's just like a quarter second, and I know what they are. So just ask people, and they'll tell you. Uh, yep. Uh, do you find there's differences between different types of psilocybin mushrooms? You know, nobody knows and no, no one will ever agree on the answer to that. But I think what really matters is how much psilocin gets into your blood and how fast it gets there. But everybody says that every mushroom has different effects. But even the same batch of mushroom has way different effects on different days, depending on your unconscious and your, your blood chemistry and so many things. So um, it's really hard to say, but I don't think so. Because with cannabis, you can kind of like... Absolutely, but you got all those different chemicals in cannabis that are also affecting it. And maybe that's the case with psilocybin, too. <laughs> Definitely more research is needed. Yes? Uh, what about um, synergy of, like, I mean, I've heard of citrus going, uh, helping, um, aiding with having psilocybin. And what about um, when you vomit, like, how... Because people still get high after vomiting, so how... Probably. It's, already, it's By the time you vomit, it's probably mostly absorbed anyway. Okay. Um, but certainly MAOI will make psilocybin mushrooms way stronger. But I don't like to mess with that stuff. I just eat more if I want a stronger <laughs> effect. <laughs> yes? So you said that some mushrooms are high, higher in psilocybin and some are psilocin. Higher in psilocin. Psilocin. Uh -huh. And psilocin is what gets you high in by right. entering into the bloodstream. So the ones that are higher in psilocybin having to go through the extra process to make it psilocin, do those take longer to affect you? I'm not sure. I think it's about the same, but probably at least a couple minutes longer. Um, but it, you know, it's really hard to tell exactly because you know it's, it's not really an exact science like the effects of it. Uh, yeah. Right. Do SSRIs, antidepressants like Prozac or Zoloft, affect your experience? You yeah, know? absolutely. Um, a lot of SSRIs make the mushrooms work a whole lot less. So some people that take SSRIs, they work just fine. Other people, the mushrooms don't work at all for them. Other people find they just have to eat a whole lot more mushrooms. But it's not dangerous to mix mushrooms with SSRIs, so you can just experiment and see if it works for you. And if it doesn't, you just got to go off your SSRI before you take it. But you know, really, these mushrooms are, have really powerful antidepressant effects. And if you take, stop taking your SSRI and instead take mushrooms, either in large dose or in micro doses, usually you can stop taking all those antidepressants and you'll feel a whole lot better than you would if you were on the medical antidepressants. When you go out on a hunt, how often do you actually find psilocybin mushrooms? It really depends on how good the season is. If the season is really good, I'll find them like maybe like a new spot in San Francisco, like once every two hours. In Mexico, it, 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 it's like two hours of concentrated searching from wood chip bed to wood chip bed. Um, here in Southern California, it would take longer because they're more rare in wood chip. But then when the pineal acinculus is fruiting really well, you probably find them every 20 minutes in lawns. Um, so it really depends on a lot of things, like you know where you're at. Yeah. Have you hunted in, uh, in, in Vancouver Island at all? No, I haven't hunted in Vancouver Island, but I know there's yeah, a lot of psilocybin mushrooms up there, and it's the same ones that we have in Washington and Oregon. Well, same as Washington, and Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. What are the things um, that degrade the active ingredient? I think a lot of it's bacteria. So I think um, just if you have your mushrooms super dry, the bacteria cannot eat anything and the potency stays for a really long time. Maybe it's oxygen, so an oxygen absorber, or just like replacing the gas with nitrogen or CO2 would probably make the mushrooms last forever. But really, they last a very long time, even with plenty of oxygen at room temperature. Yep? Uh, how often are they finding new species? 
you know, everybody wants to find new species of psilocybin mushrooms, so not very often. Um, I think, I've been hunting in Mexico for 10 years, and I found one new one, but I only found one mushroom, so I'm not going to name it until I find it again. And I keep checking the spot every year, and I haven't found any more. It's really rare. Um, but, you know, the most of the new ones to be discovered are in places like Africa and, uh, you know, unexplored places like that. Most of the ones in the United States have been named many times and already have many names, and we have to use the oldest name. Yes? Yeah, so I've, I've been kind of, like, trying to find some, like, psilocybin mushrooms here in San Diego, and, like you say, the Penelius synctilis, or the subs, are the most common here in San Diego. I've been trying to see, like, um, how often do they occur here compared to the Fonesecki or whatever? Fonesecki? Yeah. That depends on the temperature. Similar, right? So when it's cold, the Fonesecki is way more common. And when it's really hot, the Pineola cinctulus is way more common. Uh -huh. So, yeah, the ratio of them just totally varies on how hot it's been for the past couple of weeks. Yeah. Yep. What's a quick rule of thumb for saying this is a safe one and this is, and I better watch out for this one? There's no rule of thumb, but a lot of the deadly ones have either white spores or rusty orange spores. Uh -huh. So that's something you should watch out for. But there's a lot of really good edibles with white spores like shiitake. Mm -hmm. And then you have the gymnopolis, which have psilocybin and rusty orange spores. So really, you just got to take good pictures and post them online and ask the experts, or just, just learn them yourself. But rule of thumb is avoid orange and white. Yeah, but really, there's no rules of thumb, but just just, uh, just, just identify everything, and then you'll be good. Yep. How do you think uh, CRISPR and genetic modification will affect the, just the field of Probably not much at all because they're already doing what you want and they're doing it in good quantity and they're super easy to grow. So there's really no reason to genetically modify any of these things. But there are some people that have uh, put the genes from psilocybin mushrooms into yeast. So you can just like brew up a vat, uh, you know, a 10,000 liter bioreactor of genetically modified yeast to make a ton of psilocybin. But it's already super easy to make a ton of psilocybin and it's much easier to synthesize psilocybin in a lab than it is to like CRISPR an organism to make it. So I don't think they'll affect psilocybin mushrooms very much. Yes. Um, do you think uh, personally that there's say an event happens here where the dollar collapses and we go hungry, or, or even all over the world, do you think there'd be enough food for people based on edible mushrooms to, to eat for a year or two? Or, you know, um, like, well, yeah, I think uh, edible mushrooms do get pretty common, especially when it rains, but not many people know how to identify them, so most of them will go uneaten. So yeah, like if, it's, if it's raining good, yeah. Um, then yeah, there'll be a ton of food, uh, for definitely. Where would you go to talk to someone if you were interested about transitioning off of um, regular medication into the kind of mushroom that would work based on what you're prescribed? Who would you talk to about that? There's definitely that? underground psychotherapists, and um, you know it's illegal, so they're kind of risking their career to give psilocybin mushrooms to people. But especially in California, there's a lot of th psychotherapists that are happy to give psilocybin mushrooms illegally. And those kind of people, I usually meet them at psychedelics conferences. So like uh, there's MAPS conferences and there's a few other psychedelics conferences. I mean, you go there, there's just like tons of people. Anybody who's dressed like halfway professionally, you ask them like, are you an underground psychotherapist? <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're like, yes. <laughs> so yeah, that's where I would go. Uh, yep. If you were to ingest psilocybin with some frequency, what would you say is protected to do uh, well, psilocybin does not do anything bad to your organs. So really, um, overconsumption of psilocybin, the worst thing it will do to you is waste your time and maybe like make you confused. So if you're eating them like all the time, then maybe you don't have as much focus as you would normally. It's probably kind of like smoking weed all the time. So it's not terrible for you, but it's not the best use of time either. But you don't have to worry about your organs. No, it, they're water soluble. It's like you eat it and it goes out of your body completely and it doesn't have any kind of cumulative toxicity or anything like that. There's other mushrooms that will um, have cumulative toxicity like the deadly amanitas and the deadly gallerinas and stuff, but they don't have any psilocybin in them. Yes? So does that mean, because I've heard rumors that like if you've just taken mushrooms, like a, a good quantity of them, that they might not have the same effect on you for like a week or yeah. you should wait like a week or so? Yeah, you get tolerance. Just like any psychedelic, you know, have tolerance. Okay. So if you eat mushrooms and you want to eat them the next day, you'd have to eat probably twice as many. But it's usually kind of a waste of them. I, I usually tell people to wait two weeks, but yeah. usually one week is enough. Um, 
And then, you know, usually uh, like people eat, the, or a lot of people just eat the microdosing and just take like a really small amount. Like I'll just take a really small amount before bed and don't really feel anything, but you can just do that every day and just like feel really nice. How much are you microdosing? Um, I try to microdose an amount where if I was to take twice as much, I would get a buzz, but I don't feel anything directly yeah. from it. Yeah? The alcohol tincture extracts the psilocybin water? Alcohol does extract psilocybin, but water extracts it even better. So there's really no reason to use alcohol except maybe as a preservative. Yeah. But you know, ethanol does, is a drug that doesn't really mix very well with psilocybin. So I usually would say don't really use ethanol unless it's just a preservative. Um, and it's probably better just to make tea. Is it toxic together? Uh, no, they're not toxic. It's just kind of like a weird, like the, the two substances are kind of fighting each other. And it's just like not a really good experience in my, but some people love it. I mean, if you like it, do it, but it's yeah. <laughs> usually not. Uh, where do you post the pictures to get uh, accurate results on um, you mean like if you want to get them identified? Yes. So my favorite place is mushroomobserver.org, which is um, just a website. You just uh, go to mushroomobserver.org and you create observation, you upload your pictures, and then it creates like a permanent record of what you found and everyone votes on what you found. Um, then the other one is iNaturalist, which is cool because it has an app, but less cool because there's so much volume that a lot of stuff doesn't get identified very well on there. Or if somebody misidentifies an iNaturalist, a lot of times it'll stay misidentified. Whereas the Mushroom Observer gets misidentified, you know, a lot of people will see it and they'll fix it. Yes? Yeah, where do you think the furthest south, like psilocybin, the genus uh, uh, mushroom grows in, uh, in California, with, like cyanestins, I assume, like how far? Well, I mean, the uh, Psilocybe ovoideo cystidiata was found in uh, Balboa Park, which is right on the border. Okay. So they go, they go all the way in, into Ensenada to one end, no problem. Yes? Um, you said that one mushroom had the most cucumbery smell. Were uh -huh. you talking about as a mushroom in general or philosophy? To me, almost all psilocybin mushrooms have a cucumber smell, okay. and then some of them have other odors on top of it. Like psilocybin zapatocorum smells like cucumber and radish, whereas like Mexicana or Cubensis just smells like cucumber. Um, but I, yeah, I always get that cucumber. But that cucumber isn't psilocybin because there's a lot of other mushrooms that are closely related to psilocybin mushrooms that don't have any psilocybin, and they still have that cucumber. Like the other one that grows here, common I can't remember. Um, you know, I don't get much cucumber from the paniolus, okay. but the paniolus is not related to psilocybin at all. It's like way over in the, some other gen, gen, genus okay. that's really far away. So that's I kind of it's a really weird taste. It's very distinctive, but there's no English words to describe it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I, in my yard, I've got a, a, a mushroom that doesn't seem to have a stem on it. Just kind of like a spore grows out. And it's like it's like half of a mushroom coming out of a uh, part of a tree. Is that actually a mushroom, or would that be something? Like uh, that? If it doesn't have a stem and a cap, I wouldn't call it a mushroom, but definitely a fungus. So if you get, if you can show me pictures of it, or just upload pictures to Mushroom Observer, I can definitely get that identified. Can you study those two at all? Or? Yeah, yeah, I like them all. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You already mentioned MAOI. Let's talk about lines, man. Are there any mm -hmm. other compounds that you find to be interesting synergists to stack with psilocybin? Uh, I think lion's mane is the most promising one because lion's mane definitely has like really good neurogenitive effects, especially people with brain damage notice huge differences when they take lion's mane. So, um, I, you, and um, you know, psilocybin also causes neurogenesis and is really good for your brain. So. I think mixing lion's mane and psilocybin is really good. Anything else? Um, I wouldn't really mix in anything else, like too many things at once, just who knows. Yeah. But I mean, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, yeah, niacin niacin maybe is what Paul Stamets says. I don't know what the niacin does. Google, yeah. Google MAOI botanicals. Yeah, like that passion flower. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But you know, the, the MAOIs just kind of like make it so you can take less psilocybin, but there's so much psilocybin around that I think it's better not to mess with that because MAOIs do a lot of other things to your body too. Um, as far as stopping all these other chemicals from getting broken down. Mm -hmm. Like once I took a bunch of MAOI and then I ate a lot of M&Ms and I got really high off the chocolate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's dangerous. You don't, you don't want to mix stimulants with MAOIs. There's a lot of things you don't want to mix with MAOI, so that's why I don't mess with it and just eat more mushrooms. Alan, two or three more. Okay. Yes? Are there any um, known animals or insects that inhibit the production of psilocybin? Um, certainly you'll find a lot of insect bug holes and slugs eating psilocybin mushrooms. It doesn't seem to affect them or not in a negative way, if, if so. Yep. You said a food drug is dehydrated. Mm -hmm. 
temperature? No, I think um, you know they can. You can boil the mushrooms and you can fry them up, cook with them, barbecue them, whatever. Um, and they still retain their potency, so I don't think the temperature is a big deal. Dries. Yep. And I'll take one more question, and then um, you can just come up and ask me stuff later. And also, we'll be at the fungus fair on Sunday, and I'll give a talk there. Yeah. 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 All right. So last question. Uh, you mentioned uh, basically inoculating with like, uh, fresh fruiting bodies in a bottle yeah. of water. I mean, can you elaborate any more on this? non-sterile kind of inoculation yeah. So, you know, the, the right way to grow mushrooms is with sterile methods, and what you do is you put the spores or, you know, or, you know part, part of the fruiting body on agar, and you grow it on an agar, and then you move it to grain, and then you take the grain, and then move, make it, move that to like wood chips, and once the wood chips are colonized, you put it outside, or you fruit it inside. And that's the right way to do it, because then you're guaranteeing that you only have this one organism growing, and you're almost guaranteed yields. But the other way to do it, is um, a whole lot easier because you don't need any kind of pressure cooker, you don't need any sterile technique. And that's just to take the spores or the mycelium and just put them on the right substrate. So the right substrate needs to be like, usually it's wood chips and um, you can just like, you can find old psilocybin mushrooms that are totally black and nasty. They're full of spores, so you can just put that in water and shake it up really good. And you want to use that the same day or else bacteria will eat all the spores and just dump it on wood chips. And wood chips, you want like hardwood, like oak is really good, or maple, but any kind of wood will work eventually. And then you want, it's best to have irrigated wood chips. So if you have like something that, where you water it already, then that's really good, like, like in your garden or something, or in a shady spot. And it's kind of bad if it's in full sun, because that dries out really fast and makes it not work nearly as well. So a shady corner especially a shady corner that you can water or maybe even have a water timer that waters it automatically once a week during the summer would be good. But just, um, yeah, taking the spores and just tossing it on the fresh wood chips is all you really have to do. And it uh, works uh, quite a bit of the time, at least half the time. So spores also exist in the dry ones? Or just yeah, the yeah, dry ones are full of spores. Thank you very much. We got mushroom identification, chemistry lesson, some criminal justice system navigation, <laughs> and a little bit of stand-up comedy. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>